by the mid-1940s, the tides of World War II were turning, and legend has it that desperate Japanese soldiers buried a treasure of gold and relics in the Philippines. They took an immense amount of treasure from temples, from banks, anything they could lay their hands on. It's alleged to have included gold bars, which were taken, melted down as bullion, and re-stamped as Japanese gold. Is it true that a vast treasure was buried under the Philippines during World War II? And is it still there? Or did allied victors discover and take the valuables for themselves? Or is it all just a great story? The idea that there's this vast treasure under the surface, it's just too attractive to resist. The so-called lost Japanese treasure is one of the world's great unsolved mysteries. While the Nazi looting in Europe took the spotlight, Southeast Asia was also being systematically plundered. A vast collection of relics, antiques, artwork, and importantly, gold was amassed over the course of World War II. When things took a turn for the worst for Japanese forces, they are said to have desperately searched for a location to hide their priceless treasure trove. Is this mythical plunder real? If so, what was hidden and where? And what, if anything, is left today? Japan embarked on an absolutely ruthless effort to loot every country that they occupied before and during World War II. We're talking China, Korea, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, the Philippines. Nothing was safe from their soldiers. And it's the mere prospect of discovering untold wealth that continues to bring treasure hunters to the Philippines to this day. Including Klaus Donna. Four years ago, the Austrian researcher disappeared off the grid. For a time, no one knew where he was. Then only a few of his closest friends and family were told where he had gone. The Philippines, deep below ground. In the time he's been there, Klaus and his team of local workers have manually dug and pneumatically drilled vertical shafts deep into the ground, about 200 feet down. Having been given exact details on where to dig by his contacts, they unearthed an already existing network of tunnels. Who originally built them is unknown, but the fact they exist 200 feet underground makes this a very real treasure hunt. When I found out uh, how dangerous the job here is, I was hiding for a while. Only a few good friends knew where I am. On the internet, many people were searching for me, but I did not want uh, that uh, everybody knows where I am because uh, that could have brought me into danger. Klaus believes he's very close to reaching the Japanese treasure. But it's not easy down in the tunnels, and he acknowledges just how dangerous it is. In the first year, we were down already in a big hole, 30 meters, and we were already very close to one big, big bunker. And the whole mountain came down because what I did not know at that time, there was a huge amount of clay. And when that material gets dry, it will very easily collapse. The Japanese were well known to use booby traps within their bunker system complexes in the defense of the Pacific Islands. The Marines and soldiers were terrified of these things, and so usually instead of dealing with it, they would just throw hand grenades in and let the grenades take care of the booby traps. The threat of death is all too real among the treasure hunters. The digs they undertake are difficult, 
and sometimes deadly. There are many stories around this area that people died because the tunnel collapsed through a booby trap. Uh, last year, three men died because they arrived at the cement area. They thought this is the final entrance to a room. And when they started with the jackhammer drilling, they hit one of the poison put in a glass inside the cement. They hit it and they all three died immediately. There is a recurring myth that the Japanese placed cyanide bottles, brown bottles, full of this deadly drug into their tunnels. The idea being that if treasure hunters came along at a later date and stuck their spade in, it had smashed the bottle and all this cyanide would be released, killing them. I think this probably misunderstands how cyanide works. It also probably misunderstands the nature of these brown bottles, which probably held very basic medicines that the Japanese needed to treat all kinds of everyday ailments. By 1942, the Japanese Imperial Army had invaded much of Southeast Asia and removed many treasures as they looted Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and what was then known as Burma. Similar to what the Nazis were simultaneously doing across Europe, by stealing priceless valuables en masse, this practice continued in Southeast Asia for many years. As the Japanese advanced, they mercilessly ransacked country after country, stealing art, gold, and treasures on a massive scale. They are reported to have stolen from banks, museums, temples, and private collections. It was said to be unrivaled in military history, possibly surpassing even the Nazis' epic plundering. This covert operation across Southeast Asia was codenamed Golden Lily and was headed by Prince Chichibu, the emperor of Japan's brother. Japan had never lost a war and never surrendered in its entire history. And that brought about this extraordinary beyond arrogance in each individual soldier. This massive plundering of Southeast Asia was intended to fund the Japanese war effort. And the direction, the coordination of this huge theft went right up to the imperial household. And Prince Chichibu, who was the uh, brother of Emperor Hirohito, codenamed this operation Golden Lily, which actually comes from a poem that was composed by the emperor. And under this codename, Golden Lily, all of Japan's neighbors were being plundered systematically to fund Japanese rule in the region. If the Imperial Japanese Army had taken all of their plunder from private collections, from banks, bullion, gold, religious relics, if they'd taken all that to the Philippines, it would have been an incalculable hoard. They were going into temples and museums and private residences and basically hoovering up the lot. And they were taking billions of dollars worth of all this treasure, of all these artifacts, possibly down to the Philippines. Having scoured treasures from across Southeast Asia, the next step in Operation Golden Lily is to get the treasure back to Japan. Before they can do that, they first melt down the gold into easy-to-move gold bars to erase any identifying features and prevent the valuable metal from being traced back to its country of origin. The gold is then taken to the Philippines to be inventoried before being shipped home to Japan on their massive naval fleet. But before they make it home, some of the ships carrying this treasure are sunk off the coast of the islands. This plunder was meant to fund the Japanese military machine, and they knew they would need to win with technology. And they were investing heavily in some of the most sophisticated military vessels and weapons ever in history. We're talking about 
billions of dollars, maybe even a trillion dollars, that the Japanese needed to fund their war effort and to fund their control of the region, which is their overall ambition. So that had to fund the massive Imperial Navy. That had to fund all those kamikaze pilots launching their suicide missions. In order to do that, they had to steal on an epic scale across all the countries in the area. What continues to give treasure hunters hope that the great Japanese fortune still lies buried beneath the Philippines so many decades later? And how far will they go to find it? Over the course of World War II, Japanese forces acquired a vast treasure as they plundered riches from across Southeast Asia. Said to be made up of relics, artwork, and most interestingly, large amounts of gold bars, it could be worth billions of dollars. Legend has it the priceless hoard was buried in the Philippines at the end of the war. Unconfirmed reports say the Japanese forces secured their fortunes underground and placed explosives and poisonous gas traps within the tunnels to kill anyone who dared come near. Supposedly, it has never been discovered, but there are rumors of gold and valuables having been found in the area. Many treasure hunters have descended onto the islands to find it, but so far, without much success. The total treasure was said to weigh around 6,000 tons and be worth $100 billion today. Japan's gold and lily project probably was entirely real. Looting systematically is a huge purpose for embarking on war in the first place. I mean, nations go to war to gain geopolitical power and riches. Japan officially enters World War II on the morning of December 7th, 1941 with its attack on the United States' vast naval fleet, based at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The base was struck by 353 Imperial Japanese aircraft, launched from six aircraft carriers. The Japanese damaged or destroyed over 20 ships and killed or wounded over 3,500 American naval personnel. President Franklin D. Roosevelt reflected it was a date which will live in infamy. But not long after the Japanese invasion at Pearl Harbor, the tide turned. You've got to imagine what a huge reversal of fortune this is for the Japanese. In 1941, 42, they were conquering the Pacific. They had almost taken Australia. You know, they were on their way with Hitler to achieve global domination, and yet, in just a couple of years, the United States was pushing them all the way back across the Pacific, straight back to Japan. In June 1942, just six months after both sides had entered the war, the US and Japanese forces meet again at Midway Island in the Pacific Ocean. Over the span of four days, the US sinks five Japanese ships destroys 270 aircraft, and kills 3,700 military personnel. The Japanese have lost control of the seas, and the only way back to Japan for the survivors and their looted treasure is now blockaded by the US. It's too risky for them to ship the gold home. They need a new plan. Allegedly, they sink a number of their own ships at sea to keep the Allies from intercepting them and decide to bury much of the treasure hoard, especially the gold, under the island of Luzon in the Philippines. The Japanese were in a tight spot. They had all of this plunder, but if they wanted to send it, let's say, to mainland Japan, they had to risk sending a ship with the wealth of their military 
out into open waters, riddled with American warships, submarines. And so if you look at the complex island chain and archipelago of the Philippines, there are lots of little hiding spots, lots of little places where they could safely tuck away some treasure without it being noticed. And that may have been a much safer option than putting that out in the open where it could get sunk. In their final effort to protect the treasure, the Imperial family turns to one of their most experienced generals, Tamayuki Yamashita. The general is instructed to hide the gold with the hope that it can be recovered at a later time once the Japanese are victorious. He identifies over a hundred underground sites across the islands, many of which are previously existing underground networks. This was their last chance to turn the war around and General Yamashita was sent there just to do that because of his skill, expertise, and the fact that the troops under him held him in high, high regard. To hide all this treasure, it's entirely feasible that the Japanese may have used pre-existing tunnels uh, dug by the previous Spanish colonial power or the Americans, and possibly dug their own tunnels. But all of this, of course, to remain out of sight of the Americans in the air and local resistance. Yamashita orders detailed maps to be made of each treasure vault. What is stored there and how to navigate the tunnels into it, which is then carefully encoded. Unless you know the complex code, these maps are meaningless. And there are even further layers of security to defend the sites. The number of people in the know is ruthlessly kept to a minimum. But for all of Yamashita's work, the gold is still not safe. The Japanese protected their hidden treasure locations by creating a system of treasure maps coded very elaborately based on ancient Japanese symbols, which would be very difficult for anybody else to decipher. If they were able to do so, however, there was a second line of defense in the hiding places themselves in the form of booby traps such as cyanide vials that would explode upon contact, bombs, other things rigged to kill anybody who tried to go and take what the Japanese thought was theirs. With time running out, Yamashita orders the engineers to seal the treasure vaults. Yamashita has one last trick up his sleeve to protect the gold. The story goes that while the soldiers are carrying out his orders, Yamashita seals the vaults himself. With the engineers still inside, now they will be its guardians for eternity. The Japanese soldiers all knew how to basically tunnel. Every island that the Marines and army had to take from the Japanese was filled with tunnels. These tunnels weren't for plunder. These tunnels were defensive fortifications. So they were already experts, essentially, at mining and tunneling. Under sustained American attack, the Japanese decided to make their last stand in the valleys and the hills around northern Luzon and Baguio and retreated there with their treasure, where it's more than likely that they burrowed into those hills, creating new tunnels to hide away the bullion that they'd stolen from the region. Within three months, World War II is over. General Yamashita is put on trial for war crimes. He takes the secrets of the gold to his grave. There is allegedly only one other person who knows of the gold's whereabouts, Prince Chichibu, but he has already died of tuberculosis before the war ended. It seems Yamashita's gold is lost forever. Yamashita never even had the chance to consider revealing the locations of the treasure after he was captured because he was executed by the American government. Klaus Donner, an Austrian researcher dedicated to uncovering the spoils of Operation Golden Lily, claims he has found significant clues that the Japanese treasure remains in the Philippines to this day. He and his team have dug tunnels using pneumatic drills and unearthed concrete walls and unique markers 
indicating riches are buried nearby. He says he's working with insider information, which has led him down to a complex system of previously existing tunnels where the Japanese treasure is still buried, or whatever is left of it. This one is a marker. Here we have a small chamber inside with precious stones. Which, but we first finish the, the, that room, then we make this one, and then we continue here. So here in the closest area, we have four chambers and one small treasure site here. And Klaus has high expectations for what awaits because there has been a documented case of tremendous wealth being found on the island, but at great cost. The mystery of the so-called lost Japanese treasure lives on in the Philippines. It's said to be made up of priceless valuables, artwork, and most interestingly, gold bars. It's supposedly worth billions of dollars. There are unconfirmed reports that the Japanese buried it in underground sites and placed explosives and poisonous gas traps within their tunnels to kill anyone who dared to break in. Today, dozens of people are on the islands trying to discover the elusive treasure. But so far, without much success. One of those who has dedicated their life to finding the gold and treasures is Austrian historian and researcher Klaus Donner. Based on insider information from the locals, he and his team have targeted one village of particular importance. Across the site, they have dug four vertical shafts deep into the earth, some nearly 200 feet. We are not allowed to reveal the locations of his shafts, nor the information he has gleaned from the locals. But he is sure he's close. It's dark and treacherous. The threat of death is all too real. The most dangerous moment is coming when we open one of the chambers, because if there would be some dead people inside, we have to expect gas which would hit our workers and, of course, me too. So we prepared already gas masks. And then we have to be very careful because I'm sure that in the rooms you will find explosives. If we find gold bars, we have to be very careful because I got information that some of the gold bars have a, a poison on top of the gold bars. That means if you would touch them with your plain hands, you would die. So we prepared already long rubber gloves and we prepared also protection clothes. For the moment, we go inside the room. And if we have explosives inside, I get a special bomb squad to check it. With thousands of treasure hunters all over the Philippines taking great risk, uh, tunneling, excavating, so far, what's been found? Very little. But maybe someday in the future, somebody will find the hoard, the, the big one. Although Klaus hasn't made a great discovery yet, there was one infamous finding by a local that has been documented. In 1970, Filipino locksmith and amateur treasure hunter Rogelio Rojas obtained a permit to excavate a particular site in Baguio, in the north of the country. Why he chose that site is unclear, but he was reported to have dug underground for many months before uncovering an existing network of tunnels. As he dug further, there were reports of him finding weapons, a wireless radio, and the skeletal remains of Japanese soldiers. After several weeks, he broke through a concrete floor to a lower level chamber where it said he discovered a large quantity of wooden boxes, each one about the size of a beer crate. When he opened one of the crates, 
he found 24 gold bullion bars. Rojas also claimed to have discovered a golden Buddha whose head tilted back to reveal several handfuls of uncut diamonds. Now imagine that you've been searching for this for years, this is your passion, and you finally find this. This is a once in a lifetime epic find. He just hit the jackpot. His bucket list was complete. You can imagine how ecstatic he would have been. After all that digging in dusty tunnels, tunneling his way in the dark, Rogelio Rojas has that moment of wonder where he finds those 24 gold bars and the gold Buddha. You know, he's finally found the enigmatic treasure buried by the Japanese all those years ago. Rojas made no effort to conceal what he claims was a major find. He posed with the Golden Buddha for at least one newspaper photographer. And it's reported that he showed it to several potential buyers. During the following weeks, Rojas is said to have sold seven of the 24 gold bars. He did this during a time when Ferdinand Marcos was dictator of the Philippines. And Marcos had issued an edict stating that all treasure hunters needed to get permission from him in order to go searching. Well, Rojas had not done this. Ferdinand Marcos sent his henchmen to knock on this guy's door and hauled him off to prison. On April 5th, 1971, men in uniform came to Rojas's house. They showed a signed search warrant issued by the local judge, a member of the Marcos family. And they inspected his house. They attacked his brother with their rifles and terrorized his family. They came to uh, our house in Aurora Hill. They raided our place. They get our uh, personal things, Philippine money, the golden Buddha, and uh, the gold bars. They take everything. We're a happy family before, and uh, after they destroy our family circle. My dad told us that uh, everyone of our family, uh, they will kill. We run away almost half day to walk to go to the mountain. I stay at the mountain almost uh, seven years. I'm six years old at the time. We don't have any parents because uh, my dad, they put in jail almost two years. He was held captive and told to sign an affidavit that the raid on his home was performed in a peaceful manner. There is a paper they want to sign. Uh, my dad don't like to sign that paper. They tortured my dad. They put an electric shock inside the body and they hit my dad. My dad is a, uh, have a big uh, black eye. They beat him so badly about the face that he lost his eyesight in, in one eye. And he was just a completely broken man. Everything for years and years that he had strived for, he had finally achieved success. And now he was just completely physically and emotionally demoralized. Is there evidence that these riches were actually part of the Japanese treasure? And if so, is there more to be found? And if Ferdinand Marcos really stole the riches from Rojas, what happened to them? It's one of the world's great mysteries, the legend of the lost Japanese treasure. It's said to be a vast quantity of gold, relics, and other valuable objects that was secretly hidden by the Japanese in the Philippines during the final months of World War II. There have been many stories of individual valuables coming to light, but nothing as massive as what is rumored to have been buried. Yet everything seems to point to the existence of a large Japanese treasure on the islands. Is it still there, or is it a great story and nothing more?
This myth of buried treasure evidently got around. There were local people in the Philippines who looked for this treasure, and there's at least evidence of one individual who found something. Roger Rojas was digging in the area. He found a cave. It contained apparently a fabulous gold Buddha filled to the brim with diamonds and some gold bars, which he took and he attempted to sell. Once the authorities got wind of his discovery, his whole life was turned upside down. His house was raided, it, it was cleared by the authorities, he was taken into custody, he was imprisoned by the state, and, you know, he was left very much as a broken man as a result of finding this treasure. It is alleged that Ferdinand Marcos hired some experienced mining operatives to search for and find the lost Japanese treasure, and especially the gold bars. Marcos clearly wanted in on this treasure. He hired an individual called Bob Curtis, who claimed to be very experienced at this sort of thing, who went out and came back and said, look, I found gold bars, I found gemstones, I found statuary. Bob Curtis and Charles McDougall are very interesting characters, very credible characters. They claim that they have seen the treasure and, and they put a very convincing case forward. The only problem is that they don't produce any photographic evidence. And that's really where the question mark is left hanging in the air. Interestingly, the case of Roger Rojas is perhaps the one piece of this story which is documented in legitimate historical evidence. And then that is in the records of a trial that was held in the Hawaiian Supreme Court 20 years after Rojas found his treasure, when he brought suit against the Marcoses for violation of his human rights, for the torture that he was subjected to when he was imprisoned. In February 1986, Ferdinand Marcos was deposed and fled with his wife Imelda to Hawaii under US protection. He allegedly carried suitcases full of gold bullion bars and massive amounts of bullion certificates. During President Marcos's trial in 1993, American mining experts testified that Ferdinand Marcos had shown them a solid gold Buddha statue with a removable head, as Rogelio Rojas had described. It also matched the photograph of the Buddha with Rojas in 1971. They also testified that they were asked to help with the remelting of gold bullion and removing any trace elements that might reveal the country of origin. Was this the treasure that Rojas had found? Rojas again tried to press charges of bodily harm and the theft of his gold diamonds and the Buddha. A series of legal actions followed in Hawaii, culminating in a staggering jury verdict in 1996, awarding Rojas $22 billion. A Hawaiian court conclusively decided that Rojas had discovered gold treasure buried in a cave in the Philippines and that the Marcoses had taken it from him wrongly. But nothing has ever been paid to either Rojas or his family. We're waiting for the justice since 1986 until now. Rogelio Rojas died a broken man in 1993. Told to my dad, even you're died, you're dead already, dad. I will continue the case and uh, I will continue the treasure hunting activities, dad. Klaus Donner has now spent over four years on his hunt for the Japanese treasure, funded by his own money and research efforts. He and his team have excavated four large vertical shafts down to about 200 feet into the earth. He claims that he was given exact details on where to dig, and they uncovered a large tunnel network Who built them and why is unknown. But the fact that the system exists 
200 feet below ground makes this a very real treasure hunt. He still believes in absolute secrecy and maintaining security. Of course, you have to be very quiet. You can only talk with really trusted people because once you open the possibility that uh, people might try to rob what you found or even to kill you, that possibility, of course, is there. Hello, Andre. Oh, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Oh, man, it's been a while. How are you? Fine, thank you. How about you? Researcher and writer Andrew Goff is a self-confessed mystery enthusiast. He has spent years investigating the mystery of the Japanese gold. He believes that much of the treasure is still hidden underneath the Philippines. He's a friend of Klaus Donna and has visited him at his excavation site before. I've been passionate about the Philippines and the legend of the Japanese who looted 12 Asian countries. The question being, did they take that loot and bury it in the Philippines? Is that fact or is that fantasy? So over the course of a number of years, I had reached out to Klaus Donna. He had completely gone off grid. Nobody had heard from him other than the rumor that he was someplace so spectacular that he couldn't leave. There's different kinds of sites, right? There's sites that have just football pitch chamber full of gold bars, but there's also something called uh, uh, imperial treasure. What, what's that and, and which one do you think that you're close to? Uh, I'm sure that we are working on two imperial treasure sites because on the way we had a lot of booby traps. The most dangerous was always the cyanide. cyanide. They were putting cyanide in glass and they put the glass inside the cement. I know what I'm doing because with 70 years I would not be four years here digging in knowing that I'm spending my time for nothing. I hope for me that we find also many interesting, very old artifacts. Now we are really close and now we are breaking. But some believe that the treasure has already been removed from the islands by one of the greatest superpowers in the world. The myth of the so-called lost Japanese treasure is very much alive in the Philippines. It's said to be made up of priceless relics, artwork, and vast quantities of gold bars worth billions of dollars. Supposedly, after World War II, Japanese forces buried it in secret underground sites and placed explosives and poisonous gas traps within their tunnels to kill anyone who dared to break in. The Japanese general tasked with hiding and booby-trapping the loot, Tamayuki Yamashita, was tried and hanged by an American military tribunal in February 1946. He took many secrets to his grave, including the maps and specific contents of the treasure. Even today, dozens of people are on the islands trying to uncover it. But so far, few discoveries have been reported. Skeptics have questioned if the plunder is still located within the Philippines. Perhaps the victorious American forces discovered the underground chambers and took everything for themselves. Or is it just a fantastic story with no proof to back it up? It's said that 175 or more sites were created. Japanese soldiers, prisoners of war were conscripted to dig these things, to move all the treasure in, and then to climb in after it to face their death because they knew too much about what was hidden there. Eventually, General Yamashita's driver and right-hand man, Major Kojima, was tortured and allegedly revealed 176 treasure sites in the Philippines. There is a fascinating story that Major Kojima was interrogated by a Filipino called Santa Romana. And Santa Romana goes in very hard on Kojima. He's really rough with him. He's trying to find out where those tunnels, where that treasure is. At some point, 
somebody called Edward Lansdale, who's working for US intelligence, comes into the room and tries a different tack. Santa Romana's strong arm tactics haven't worked. Edward Lansdale simply offers Kojima a cut of the action, a commission, if the treasure can be revealed. Well, that seems to change the whole atmosphere and Kojima starts talking. You know, one might say that loyalty would have prevented Kojima from revealing where the treasure was. But if Kojima knew that the war was basically done, and he was sort of looking to what's, what lies next on the horizon for him personally. If I was in his shoes, I probably would have told where the treasure was. I would have taken the cut, as they say. There is a strong belief that the American soldiers did find out about the hidden treasure in the Philippines, and that through torture and tunneling, they managed to find it. According to reports, the treasure turned out to be worth an absolute fortune. The claims are that a secret fund was set up by the Americans called the Black Eagle Trust. It provided very secret but very substantial funding to all manner of covert projects over the next 50 years. These are alleged to have included campaigns against the Russians and the Cold War, the drug barons in South America, more recently, Al-Qaeda and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But there is no concrete proof this trust really existed. There's a very well-established conspiracy that the American CIA operatives set up an epic slush fund called the Black Eagle Trust to be used to fund covert activities in support of anti-communism and the Cold War generally throughout the world, beginning in the 1950s, supporting the Korean War, in the 1980s, supporting Ronald Reagan's Iran-Contra crisis. And according to these theorists, they do not specify, but it's enough further action to fill several volumes. If the story is true that the Americans used all these assets to fund covert anti-communist activities around the world, the question has to be asked, was there anything left for the Marcuses? While the Black Eagle Trust may or may not be real, in the Philippines, Klaus Donner firmly believes the treasure is still there and that he is on the verge of discovering it. It's one of the world's great mysteries, the legend of the lost Japanese treasure. It's said to be a vast quantity of gold, relics, and other valuable objects that were stolen during World War II. At the same time the Japanese forces were looting Southeast Asia, their Axis partners, the Nazis, systematically plundered Europe. They hoarded large amounts of relics, artwork, and gold bars. It eventually took a team of allied military investigators called the Monuments Men to find and recover the stolen goods. But while much of the Nazi plunder has been found, the alleged Japanese treasure is still missing, said to be buried underneath the Philippine Islands. So is the legendary Japanese fortune still there after all these years? Or is it all a great story and nothing more? Many treasure hunters have descended on the islands to try and find it, but so far, without much success. This treasure would make you wealthy beyond your dreams back home. What would you do? And we actually have a number of examples of Allied soldiers finding plundered treasure and loot throughout both the Pacific and Europe, bringing it home with them. So it's not implausible that some of these tunnels were found and we've got some folks running around either England or America, very wealthy today, and nobody knows why or how. Klaus Donner is an Austrian researcher who has dedicated the past few years of his life to finding the Japanese gold. Four years ago, he seemed to disappear. For a time, no one could find him. Then, only a few of his closest friends and family were told about where he had gone the Philippines. I know some people who really found some treasures, some 
gold bars, a small jar with some diamonds, and I was shocked. The Japanese allegedly hid their treasure hoards in places they'd remember, so mountains, military bases, schools, hospitals, places that will be around in 50 years, or at least there'll be a geographic memory of them. What's interesting is they created three levels of maps. Here's a map of all the sites where we've deposited treasure. Here's a map of the site that has symbols in the landscape. And then there's the engineering map, the third map, that tells you about the tunnel. It goes 40 meters this way, then it goes down, then it goes left, etc. Those are all gone now. Klaus claims that he was given all sorts of important information by people who knew what was hidden and where the Japanese put their treasure. That's the horse head, sir. This is here? Yes, yeah. sir. And then the eagle. That's eagle. amazing. It does look like a, a horse's head, doesn't it? There's the eye, there's sort of the nose. And another one we have over there that looks, for me, like a geographical map of the area here, that when they came back, they would have the map. They would know exactly which direction means what. Makes a lot of sense. To find the next uh, markers. The interesting thing about Klaus are his methods. They're, they're a combination of many different disciplines. He uses maps. He researches his areas that are more likely than not to have been places where the Japanese could have hidden things. He also interviews people, talks to the elders to understand, you know, have you seen something? Can I find an eyewitness? I met also another eyewitness when he was 16 years old. He was working for his father on the field. And then some Japanese soldiers came. They just took all the corn on the floor and they loaded heavy boxes on that small cart, and they forced the young guy to bring those pieces up to one of the places where we are now working. And he saw how they brought the heavy boxes up to the small hill. That's exactly the place where we were digging. Klaus, you've told me before that these sites can't be discovered by just anyone. They're spiritually protected. What, what do you mean by that? And can you give me some examples? We have a lot of examples, but uh, for this place, Chubi can prove that Japanese, they saw Japanese soldiers, ghosts, Ghost. marching up here with combat boots and helmets and everything. Marching up here? Marching up here. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Well, In the night, yeah, in the night. Even the day. Even on the day. Yeah, yeah. Some children are playing around. They saw the, the yeah. Japanese. Yeah. yeah. How can you explain that? I mean, That's nobody amazing. would believe you That's anyway. Amazing. There's also stories of a little bit of a paranormal where some of the elders and some of the locals see a marching Japanese army that isn't there in the actual excavation site, in the tunnels, he's starting to see symbols. He found this huge heart with an artery in the middle of the tunnel. Keep in mind, the tunnel is closed. You have to break it with a chisel. And, and what fell out was this huge heart, a known Japanese symbol that means you're gonna love what's below. Klaus isn't short of determination and enthusiasm, and nobody can take that away from him. And he's, he's used techniques like dowsing to try and find the treasure, to uh, warn of the booby traps. He's dug his own tunnels. He's identified what he believes are markers in the countryside that indicate where those tunnels are. But are these markers real? Look, here, for example, is another typical uh, marker, because you can see that this and this is a different material, no? And here. Right. 
It looks like a big tunnel right? and side tunnels, and we know that the, here are tunnels with side tunnels. No? In the village where Klaus is digging, the Japanese come repeatedly asking about a particular tree. I've seen that tree. Of course, everyone says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no such tree, not here. So there's a memory or some copies of these maps that have, you know, trees that aren't indigenous, stones that are carved to look a certain way. And this gets into the realm of, are you seeing things or is it, are these really markers? I think if we had the original maps, that had the location of where these symbols are, then it would be a lot more believable. As Klaus and his team burrow further into the ground, their journey will become even more perilous. That's one of the most dangerous types of digging or excavating you can do. And this can kill uh, within minutes. It's one of the great questions in the Philippines today. The mystery of the lost Japanese treasure. It's said to be a huge amount of gold bars, sacred relics, and other valuable objects that was secretly hidden by the Japanese in the Philippines at the end of World War II. There have been many stories of parts of the treasure being found, but nothing has been proven. And yet all the stories seem to point to a large amount of gold buried in the Philippines. But is it still there? Did the American forces discover the underground vaults and remove it? Or is it all a great tale, but nothing more? Skeptics will say, well, no treasure has ever been found, so there is none. But, you know, think about human nature. It's more than likely that there have been treasure hunters out there looking for all this loot. And if they've found it, why would they go public? Isn't it more likely they just keep it privately to themselves? Austrian researcher Klaus Donna has spent the last four years digging down into the Philippines, looking for the Japanese treasure. He believes he's close and that he will unearth a great find. There are many factors that lead Klaus to be so resolute that he has found a Japanese treasure site. For instance, he's working on a former Japanese military base. He's working at a site where the elders have told them that not only have they seen Japanese coming and burying big, heavy boxes, but that Marcos, the then president, visited and said, this is the site that I want to excavate next. Donna is taking a, perhaps a different approach from some treasure hunters. He's using the ancient technique of dowsing. Now, dowsing is something which has absolutely zero credibility in terms of scientific proof, but there is a great deal of belief in its power as an intuitive approach where one holds a stick of some kind, walks around over a very carefully considered location that's been chosen for very specific reasons, and hence, you might find what you're looking for when you do your research, whether you do it by dowsing or just opening your eyes. You can use dowsing to find, for example, remains in archaeological digs. And most archaeologists would die rather than admit that they employ a dowser, but they have over the years. You have map dowsers who actually have a map and they hold a pendulum or, or dowsing rod over it, and they locate what they're looking for on a map, which sounds impossible, which sounds ridiculous, but actually, most times, it works. Dowsing can work for whatever you're thinking about. You could find Grandma's lost wedding ring in the back garden if you wander along with a pair of bent coat hangers thinking, Granny's lost wedding ring. It's real. That's why when people think water, oil, Uri Geller earned his millions by dousing for oil in Texas. I started and I found out where the rooms are and where there might be rooms. And then I started asking also if I could find some cyanide or 
if I can find some dangerous sites. And it, it was getting better and better and better. I must admit, I was skeptical about dousing for things other than water. You know, how are you going to ask yes, no questions? Who is responding? How can you trust that? But I have seen him now over a course of uh, two or three years, and he succeeds every time. I mean, th this is ancient technology taken to a, a whole new level. What's over that direction? That's cyanide over there. That's the cyanide. Yeah. About the level where we are now, very deep. That means if you make a mistake, you never get the treasure. Eh? I've learned of the fact that five or six people die every week in the Philippines from cyanide. I've gone to the Philippines to treasure sites and had people show me it's over there beneath the waterfall. I went in there and I felt my foot burning and look at my foot now. I have no toes. Um, I'm, I'm missing fingers on my hand because I've gone in too close to the cyanide and it was released. So as spectacular and unbelievable as it sounds to think that there's cyanide just beyond the, 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 the walls that, that, that Klaus is traversing, um, I actually think it's true because I've seen the firsthand evidence of people who have lost limbs from the cyanide and are lucky to be alive. So to, to get around that, he douses in each site twice a day to make sure that, is it safe to go forward? No, it's not. Is it safe to go left? No, it's not. Is it safe to go right? Okay, it's safe to go right. Here we go, guys. You go there, I'll go check the other sites. So that's how he does it. There's an immense amount of danger. How close is Klaus to reaching the Japanese treasure? How accurate are the signs and markers that his team are following? Or is it all just a chase after fool's gold? That's amazing. It does look like a horse's head, doesn't it? The legend of a hidden Japanese treasure buried under the Philippines in the closing months of World War II has become something of a legend. It supposedly includes vast amounts of gold bars, treasure, and relics. But is it actually there? Treasure hunters are supposed to go and get a license, a permit to operate. They're supposed to specify where they're digging. But in reality, you know, if you're a treasure hunter in the Philippines, you're probably going to go looking for this treasure. If you find any, well, you're going to keep it a secret to yourself. Austrian explorer Klaus Donna has spent over four years digging his way down into the Philippines. He says he's following very detailed information given to him by the locals. He's burrowed into previously existing tunnels, 200 feet below ground, using a pneumatic drill. He believes he's close. I'm quite sure on our four places now we are very, very close because first was the white ceramic. The next layer had some leaves in front, gold dust and diamond dust. And we have a, a big echo on each of the places in front and sometimes also on the side. That means the entrance and then the room going around the corner, the chamber. The incredible thing is that Klaus didn't just open a hatch and find the open tunnels. He found the site and identified where the tunnels used to be. So they're filled with cement. The Japanese created the tunnels, put something at the end of them, then sealed it with cement. And that's what he's digging through, a few inches every day. Klaus is excavating vertically. He's digging tunnels straight down. And that's one of the most dangerous types of digging or excavating you can do. In this area, particularly with the volcanic activity, you get instabilities within the rocks, but you also get gases coming out from the volcanic activity, such as sulfur. And this can kill uh, within minutes. I'm really not a squeamish guy. I'm not claustrophobic. I've crawled through mastabas and pyramids all over the world, no problem. 
But these tunnels are different. You're taking your life into your own hand as you descend down. The ladder is completely vertical and made of bamboo. So the, the steps where you put your feet, you get about that much of your foot secured, and it's completely wet. I distinctly remember, what am I doing? I could die, I could fall. It, it, you know, it takes all of your focus and all of your attention to just get down to the point where now you have to walk on your hands and knees. You know, it's not every day you just send down into a, uh, a tunnel shaft laced with cyanide. That's very painful. And you think, OK, fine, I'm crawling to some place that is going to lead to uh, a reveal. No, it's going to lead to another bamboo staircase that's going to go down another 60 feet. It couldn't be any more inhospitable. And the workers know what I'm like. They know that there's cobras all around. I don't like snakes. And there were snakes in the tunnel. And when you finally get down there and realize this is where they're working every single day, knocking with a hammer and chisel a few inches off, hauling it back up, it, it, it's the most in incredible feat. How many people are working down here at any time? Three in this tunnel, three in that tunnel, and the others bringing the material up from top. That's a lot of people. That's a lot to coordinate. Oh, yeah. Careful, because here you have cyanide, and on that side you have also cyanide. So if we would not have find the exact entrance, we would have had a big problem, or we, we, we would have lost our life. Well, I'll tell you one thing. This is the closest I've been to death, I think. It's very close. That's why I am every day down here checking because I don't want to lose one of my boys. Mm. Definitely not. Mm. Yeah. Because all the gold of this world is, would not pay for one human life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The really interesting thing is you finally reached the bottom. He hasn't gone any further. You're at the very end of where he has gotten to. And you would think, all I want to do is sit here, explore, contemplate. No, you want to get the hell out of there because you fear not that it's going to collapse on you, but you can't imagine how it feels to be that deep in such a tiny space. You just want to leave. This is not easy. This is not oh no, um, health and safety walk in the park. It's damn dangerous, but the reward is going to be oh yeah, huge, hopefully that we find a lot of ancient artifacts and hopefully also gold, because with that we can help again other people so give and take. So I pay for the other excavations and continue, of course. But some locals are skeptical that anything is left to be found. Whatever valuables were in the banks at that time, they were systematically looted. The legend of the Japanese gold is very much alive in the Philippines. It's said to be made up primarily of large amounts of gold bars, and it's said to be worth billions. There are unconfirmed reports that the Japanese army buried this treasure in several underground sites, which they then booby-trapped to kill anyone who dared to break in. The massive treasure has supposedly never been discovered. Although gold and valuables have reportedly been found in the Philippines before. If the Japanese had brought treasure from all their occupied territories into the Philippines, as many people have suggested over the years, then the value of this would have been incalculable. The tunnels the Japanese used to bury the gold and the treasure and whatever else they had, a lot of those were pre-existing. Now, Klaus's uh, is over 200 feet deep in four different sites. It appears, though, 
Those are tunnels that were constructed purposely by the Japanese because it was on their military base near the ocean, near a harbor where a ship could come up and they could unload. So there may have been some smugglers' tunnels that gave them a head start, but it does appear deep tunnels were man-made and filled up by the Japanese. But despite their belief that they are on the hunt for and very near to find the so-called lost Japanese treasure, not everyone believes that it's there. Tunneling is really advantageous to the Japanese as a form of defense. You can get a kind of small, wiry little Japanese guy down a tunnel, but you can't get a great big US Marine down it. Um, and we see that in Vietnam 20, 30 years later. So actually, tunnels are essential for Japanese defense. They're essential for hoarding far more useful things, uh, such as food, ammunition, and other sorts of supplies. You know, actually, booty and plunder and bars of gold are pretty far down the list. And actually, you're probably not going to store them in a place your enemy's going to try and attack. You're going to probably want to store them in the safest place possible, and that's back home. Now, for me, as somebody who understands the logistics of military operations, this doesn't hold a lot of water. The reason is, imagine all the logistics the Japanese needed to get those goods up the mountain. You would have needed a similar, if not greater, logistical trail or chain to do the same thing, getting it down the mountain and out into the system. Now, soldiers talk, and the rumor mill among soldiers runs rampant. And the fact that there have not been any real credible reports from soldiers or Filipinos who said, I actually carried some of this plunder, this treasure down from the cave or from the mountain, tells me that it seems unlikely they would have been able to pull off an operation like that with such secrecy that there's absolutely no evidence of it. It's often said that the Japanese may have dynamited, even booby-trapped their own tunnels. There's even one story that General Yamashita himself even blew up one of the tunnels knowing that there were a number of his own soldiers inside and he entombed them deliberately. Conversely, if we look at the way the Americans conducted their warfare in the, in the region at that time, they, would, they could have easily dynamited those tunnels as well. They would have believed there were Japanese soldiers in a network of tunnels waiting to spring out. Why would they bother to engage them underground? Wouldn't it be better to just dynamite them and enclose them there and move on? The Japanese Imperial Army seemed to have believed that they could hide this vast hoard, so-called Golden Lily Hoard, in tunnels dug deep into the hills as they retreated. But not all Filipinos are convinced that the treasure is real. Dr. Ricardo Jose is an expert on the history of the Philippines. He does not believe that there is any gold or treasure buried on the island, and does not believe that Klaus will discover anything. I don't see the logic of burying treasure in the Philippines, uh, particularly in 1944 because first the guerrillas were all over the place. The guerrillas were watching, they had eyes and ears everywhere. They would have known what was going on. They, they would have reported this. And then uh, secondly, the Japanese could have used other areas to ship the gold or the other treasures through. They could have used uh, Vietnam, Taiwan, Korea, which were theirs anyway. He believes that the treasure was looted by the Japanese army, but that the gold and bullion had already been taken out of the Philippines by the Americans. Some of the treasures looted from Philippine banks, maybe gold bullion, was taken by the Japanese in these trucks. It was taken out in February 1942, when the Americans felt that eventually the fortress of Corregidor would fall. So they made it an emergency plan to take all the Philippine gold out of the Philippines. What we do know is also in December of 1944, the Japanese would begin systematically looking at each bank and signing receipts for whatever valuables were in each of the banks. After the war, in fact, the bankers would say the Japanese took this from us. And uh, this would involve uh, paper money from before the war. It would involve coins that had been put in safety deposit boxes. Whatever valuables were in the banks at that time, they were systematically looted. 
But modern day treasure hunters aren't deterred by this harsh reality. They firmly believe there are still priceless valuables to be found. If you're a treasure hunter today, do you think, hey, I'm gonna go by the book and get a permit and find the treasure? No, you don't, because you know you're putting up a signal to the government that you've got a treasure site and they'll probably kill you like they killed Roger Rojas. So nobody asks for a permit, and plus they don't want to give away 30% of what they, they find to the government. And that's why you don't hear about discoveries, because it's all on the lowdown. There's places in Manila that will melt down gold and put it into a modern standard. That's what's going on. Treasure has been found in the Philippines, and no doubt treasure will be found again in the Philippines. Is it going to be proof of the Yamashita's gold mystery? I need some real proof, and I haven't seen any so far that it is real. Although Klaus believes his search is nearing completion, challenges lie ahead. The closer you get, the more unexpected trouble are showing up. Legend has it that the so-called lost Japanese treasure is buried within the island of Luzon in the Philippines. It's said to be made up of ancient relics, artwork, and most interestingly, large amounts of gold bars. It's supposedly worth billions of dollars. There are unconfirmed reports that at the end of World War II, the Japanese forces constructed very secure treasure sites. The army buried it all in numerous underground tunnels and placed explosives and poisonous gas traps within these tunnels to kill any intruders. Many people, both locals and foreigners, are in the Philippines trying to discover it, but so far, without much success. The thing about the Philippines is it's long been treasure central. You know, way before Yamashita, you had rumors of American uh, bullion being located in the region, but even more attractive, the Spanish rule of the Philippines for 400 years. Think of all those galleons loaded with silver and gold coming from the New World that were shipwrecked, and some of these shipwrecks undoubtedly exist. So the Philippines has always been a magnet for those looking for treasure. At their undisclosed excavation site in the Philippines, Klaus and Andrew go underground they have dug two tunnels at this site, but due to excessive rainfall, only one of them is stable enough to enter. Three to four weeks ago, we had three weeks continuing heavy rain, one typhoon, one monsoon hit us, and we had a big problem in the tunnels because it was too much water. We have here water. The ladder is very slippery. Here we have a round boulder, a marker, that we saw that we are on the right way down inside the air shaft. And I can see already that there is still a lot of water in the tunnel. Researcher and writer Andrew Goff is a self-confessed mystery enthusiast. He has investigated all manner of stories and has spent years researching the legend of the Japanese gold. You did it, Andrew. Thank you, guys. I'm proud of you. That, was, uh, that wasn't so bad. Very exciting. So shall we go? Andrew, this on that side, that is our deep hole. That's the soft tunnel. And now we go, we are on 42 meter, and we go here, the other tunnel. The thing about Klaus's work is that you would think after three years he would have found it. But the fact is, the reality is, these chambers are incredibly deep, and, and that's why nobody has found them. They're from a historical record of people um, around the time when the first chambers were excavated indicate that they're about 220 to 230 feet deep. Now, Klaus is just about there. He's probably within 10 or 15 feet of that level. 
it's absolutely humbling to be down here and to realize the effort that goes into these inhospitable conditions. I mean, I know there's usually not water in here, but Klaus, this is extreme. It was, it was a horrible hard time sometimes because sometimes you are not, you cannot sleep in the night. You wake up sweating. You think, are you on the right way? Is all the time and the money you had to spend for nothing? Do you really find something? But thanks to that gift, we would, without that, we would never have been able to find those perfect markers, the ceramic wall and all this, which gives me the knowledge that now we are really close. But on the other hand, the closer you get, the more unexpected trouble are showing up. Mm. It looks like somebody would test you. Is he really able to get it? Is he the right one to get it? So let him get a lot of water. Let him blow off the generator, uh, burn out the pump. And then you have to count. Can I buy a new pump? pump? Ah, it's getting already tight. With more budget, we would be long already finished. So what are you going to progress next? We go, we break the cement with the leaves and the echo shows me that we are close and then we should be in the first room. Amazing, so you're talking maybe a week or two weeks of work? One, two, three weeks. Right. I don't know how right. thick is uh, the wall. Amazing work, amazing work. On the way down, we always found special markers that gave us the security that we are really on the right way. For example, we found triangle stones. We found round stone with a hole inside, which means also correct destination. We found incense, big parts of incense in the hard material. Here you had, we had also white, a white layer showing us that that's another way to a tunnel. So we are here on a crossing point of one, two, three treasure sites. When you find white cement, that means you are very, very close and we've, we got already on all four of our sites white layers, so that's made me sure that we are now really close. And also we found close to the white, we got some layers with gold dust, we got some layers with diamond dust. So that means we are definitely on the right way. I'm astonished at the commitment that an effort like this requires. I mean, just look at this. You couldn't possibly have more arduous conditions. But everything that he says is true. This is all man-made, it's artificial. And by all accounts, he's really close. Despite funding difficulties and torrential flooding, Klaus and his team remain dedicated to their mission of finding the lost treasure. The fact that we're on the cusp of success, I'm very excited. The legend of a huge treasure of gold bars and valuables, buried deep underneath the Philippines by the Japanese forces at the end of World War II, is still being sought today. Is there any truth to the myth? And if so, is there anything left of the fortune? If we assume that the Japanese took some of that treasure out on hospital ships, that the Americans used a big chunk of it to fund covert anti-communist activities in the Cold War, and that the Marcuses got their fingers all over it as well, we have to ask ourselves how much of it is left. Perhaps the most interesting story was that of Rogelio Rojas, the local carpenter who claimed to have discovered a fortune underground, including treasures and vast amounts of gold bullion. He says that the former Philippines leader, Ferdinand Marcos, sent his henchmen to steal what Rojas had found. 
at a subsequent court case in Hawaii, Rogelio Rojas was awarded billions of dollars in compensation. What Rojas found was fascinating. He found the skeleton remains of a Japanese officer. He found various weapons, samurai swords. He found 24 gold bars and a golden Buddha. The presidential palace under Marcos is supposed to have had tremendous amounts of gold, including Rojas's gold Buddha. But there was also gold bars put between plaster walls. Everything was laden in gold. It's as though they had come into large amounts of gold and wanted to make sure that everybody knew it. Despite numerous theories about where the valuables might have gone over the decades, Klaus Dona is one of the many treasure hunters who believe it's still buried deep underground. We are on the bunk of war. Very, very hard to go through because as I heard, the bunk of wars are between three and five meter thick of this very, very hard cement. We had a big problem in the tunnels because we were filled with water, so we had to buy additional pumps to pump out the water. All the tunnels are in a good shape, no danger for the people, so we can finally continue, and I'm quite sure we are very, very close to a success. Klaus has expended huge effort in the Philippines and really tapped into that belief that there is treasure underneath the ground in that country. And he's found markers, which he claims that the Japanese put there, locating the tunnels. He's dug his own tunnels. He's used dousing to try and find this treasure. But, you know, after years of effort and years of determination, and nobody can take that away from Klaus, unfortunately, he's found nothing. Klaus, after years of supporting a long and deep dig, is very low on funds. It's really difficult to get your head around how expensive this operation is. Klaus is a 70-year-old Austrian. He's retired. He's now having to employ over a dozen people. I've stayed with Klaus in his home. Every night, the workers come over, and Klaus's partner feeds them every single night. And when I ask the, the core members of his team, do you think you're about to discover a Japanese treasure hoard? They say, yes, of course. And I say, what are you going to do when you get your share of all those millions? I'm going to open up a rice farm. It's as though the quest is what keeps them going, not so much the money at the other end. Patrick Nicholas has worked with Klaus's team for the last four years. He's a former aircraft technician and helps locate the tunnels. I mean, there are many times that I've seen him through, go through his challenges, and I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I would have quit a long time ago. However, the focus and the devotion that he has to what he's doing is something that I'd like to really get close to. The fact that we're on the cusp of success, I'm very excited, you know? And I also understand that, you know, the closer we get to success, the more obstacles that we'll have, the more challenges we'll have. But we just have to stay focused, you know? Thank you. See you next week. OK. Have a good one. have to do a lot. OK. Bye. Have a safe trip. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Klaus is absolutely resolute, not one iota of doubt that he's going to find the treasure. His motto is, we dig it. No worry. It will happen. With all of these treasure hunters and all the labor hours that have gone into digging, tunneling, excavating, what has been found so far? At the very best, maybe we know the geology a little bit better, but in terms of treasure, not a single thing. Klaus Donna is utterly convinced he's going to find this treasure. Does that mean he will? The harder you try, the more likely you are to succeed at anything, so I say go Klaus. Sometimes these things are all consuming. You know, actually looking for treasure becomes a hobby uh, rather than an end in itself. So, you know, good luck to the man. I'll buy him a drink if he finds 20 million pounds worth of gold, you know, over the next four years. But in the meantime, you know, he should just enjoy the jungle. <laughs>